time's sake, but I would encourage you to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 because there it says that all of the things that were written in the Old Testament were written for our learning so that we through them would learn not to lust, not to murmur, not to complain, not to be destroyed of the, of the destroyer. And, you know, I feel like this is why so many people have problems is because they don't take the word and they don't learn from other people's experiences. They have to learn everything by hard knocks. And I tell you, hard knocks is a great teacher if you live through it. <laughs> but not everybody survives the school of hard knocks. There's a better way, and that's the word of God. And I got born again when I was eight years old. I have never said a word of profanity, never taken a drink of liquor, never smoked a cigarette. I'm not saying that to pat me on the back. I'm just saying that I've been seeking God my whole life, and I haven't learned a lot of things by hard knocks. You know what? I went to the Bible, and I learned through David. This book I've got is entitled Lessons from David. I learned things through David about what adultery will do and how it destroyed his family. It cost a child his life. It cost multiple of his children their lives. And it caused terrible things. Tens of thousands of people died because of his adultery. And I tell you, I've learned these things vicariously through him. And I haven't had to learn them all through my own hard knocks. And I'm telling you, this is why so many people are having problems is because they just don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. They're going to, you know, they and Frank Sinatra, they did it their way. <laughs> Anyway, I hadn't got time to go through the whole thing, but I want to focus in 1 Samuel chapter 17 on David fighting Goliath. And there are lessons to learn. All of us have problems that face us. It may not be a physical giant, but this is just such a great story, and there's so many great applications that we can make to every one of our lives. And the Scripture says that God is no respecter of persons. If God will do this for David, he'll do it for you. This is not just a Bible story about something that happened thousands of years ago that has no bearing on us. If you would receive it, this will really speak to you. <clears throat> so most of us are aware that this is a story of when the Philistines came and fought against the Israelis, and they had a giant named Goliath that came out, and he issued a challenge. <clears throat> and he says, I'm a Philistine, and you're all servants of Saul. He says, I'm a man. Send a man out to fight me. And if I win, then all the Israelis will be our servants. If he wins, then all the Philistines will be your servants. And he issued this challenge. And the men of Israel, every time they saw him, they would just cow. And they would go hide in, in caves and behind rocks and things like this. The entire army was uh, intimidated by them. And so it says here in... Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 17 that Jesse, who is David's father, said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren an ephah of parched corn and ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. In other words, this is before the days of communication the way that we have it today. And they, he was wanting to know how the brothers were doing in the battle. And so they sent the youngest one, David, out to see how they were doing. Again, I'm talking as fast as I can. But uh, I would encourage you to go study this whole thing. In the 16th chapter, David had been anointed to be the king. But nobody knew it. Nobody but his family knew it. it they were hiding it because he would have been killed if they'd have known that Samuel had anointed him to be king. But David was an anointed king, and his father sent him to see how his brethren were doing. And as he got there, it says that Goliath came out <coughs> and issued this uh, challenge unto them. And uh, in verse 30, uh, 24, it says, And the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from before him and were so afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up surely to defy Israel? Is he come up? And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the man that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that take, uh, killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach of him from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Boy, there's so much here, but I've got to point out. He says, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? You know, today most people miss this, but what he was referring to, circumcision was a sign of the covenant. He's saying, This man doesn't have a covenant. 
The reason that David had a different way of looking at things than everybody else is because he saw things in light of the covenant. And brothers and sisters, there is, uh, we have a covenant today that is awesome. It makes what David had look like nothing in comparison. God has promised us victory. God has promised us all of these things. But the average person deals with their problems in life based on their own ability. See, this is the reason that all the rest of the people, when they saw Goliath, they fled. Because they saw Goliath and his stature, most people believe he was nine foot six inches tall. And they saw them. Most, most men in those days were five feet tall. This guy was nearly twice as tall as them. They were looking at things in the natural. And if you just look at things in the natural, then when these problems come, you're going to shrink in fear. You're going to feel inadequate. But when you deal with things from the covenant, it makes all of the difference in the world. Did you know in 2008 and 2009 when we had what many people call the quote-unquote great recession, that was the worst time in the world for ministries. You know, we have over 200 parachurch ministries here in Colorado Springs, and I know many of them. And I'm in touch with them. And there's only two ministries that I'm aware of that didn't cut back. Even before the effects of this recession hit, ministries started planning on failure. They were looking at things in the natural. It was right at that time when the Lord spoke to me about starting building a Bible college up in Woodland Park, Colorado. We had zero money. Zip. Nada. And we started the biggest expansion I have ever made in my life during the Great Recession. But you know the reason that I was able to do it is because I had a covenant. God said he would supply our need according to his riches and glory. You know, Ken made a reference to this during the offering today, that God's going to supply your needs not according to the nation that you live in, but we've got a covenant with God. And I'm saying this in love. Please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But there's people sitting right here in this room that when the Great Recession hit, I guarantee you, you panicked, you had fear because you looked at things without the covenant. You weren't saying that God is going to supply my needs, but you were looking to your job. You were looking to the U.S. economy. And that's what makes people run in fear. We've got a covenant that we have already been promised victory in every single thing, but you have to approach life and every situation on the basis of the covenant that God has given you, not looking at things in the natural. David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? He was looking at the covenant. I've got a covenant with God. This man has no right to stand before any man. It was a promise in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that there will be no man able to stand before you your entire life. Goliath was a man. He was a big man, but he was a man. And he had no right to stand there. And this is what gave David this boldness. And did you know, look at this in verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the man. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why art thou come down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride in the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. In other words, he was saying, David, you came down here for all these selfish reasons and stuff, and he impugned his character, said that you aren't keeping your responsibilities, you've abandoned these sheep. The truth is, his father sent him. We read that in verse 17. He was in complete obedience to his father. He was doing what his father told him. But here is a great truth. David didn't spend any time defending himself. One of the greatest experiences I ever had was when I was in the Baptist church and Jamie and I had gotten turned on to the Lord and we were preaching the word that the Lord was showing us and man, we were being criticized and persecuted and people telling us we were of the devil and I went to a meeting and a friend of mine called me out and he said, I see you like a runner on a track on one of these oval tracks and he says, you're running the race and he says, you're leading the pack but the people in the grandstands are saying, you're doing it all wrong, and they're criticizing you. And he says, I see you getting off of the track and going up into the grandstands and arguing with the spectators. He says, even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the race. Stay on track. 
And man, that was a word from God to me. And this is exactly what David was doing. David could have got in and he justified himself and he says, Now, hey, God, you know, Jesse told me to come. I'm, and he could have defended himself. But look what he did. He just says, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? He had a purpose, a reason for living that was bigger than justifying himself and looking good in the eyes of his older brother. Boy, these are great lessons to learn from David that most of us are more concerned about people's opinion than we are accomplishing what God has called us to do. There are many of you that, you know, you work in a place, you're around people that they have ungodly attitudes and you, you know the truth. You could speak into that situation, but you're afraid to because somebody might roll their eyes. Somebody might call you a fanatic. Somebody might say something about you. You're up in the grandstands trying to be accepted by everybody. I tell you, you're going to lose the race. We've got a purpose. We've got a cause. There was an enemy out there, and it was not time for David to be arguing with his older brother about who's right and who's wrong. Did you know it's your family, typically, that will reject you? Jesus said this. He says, um, a man has honor everywhere except in his own house and among his own kin and among his own family. And part of that is because if, you're, if the people who are closest to you that saw you when you were a little kid with a runny nose, they wiped your bottom, changing your diaper. And if God can use you and if you can be elevated to this position where God is using you, that condemns them. If God could use you, he could use them. Most people are shooting at nothing and hitting it every time. And when you start trying to do something different, they will be convicted. And the easiest thing to do, instead of come up to your level, is to criticize you and to tear you down. And so this is what they will do. This is, I don't know if you remember O.J. Simpson, but they had this man who was a witness against him, and it was a damning witness, but the way the defense dealt with it was they discredited the guy. I think it was Mark Furman. I'm not sure about the names. But they discredited him and showed him as a liar and he had a terrible background. And because of it, they threw out his testimony. Did you know when you start speaking the word of God, people who don't want to change, people who are going to be convicted will come out against you. It's actually a compliment. If you throw a rock into a pack of dogs, the one that yelps the loudest is the one that got hit. Persecution is actually a great compliment. It means that you're doing something. David, he didn't get into the grandstands. He wasn't arguing with his brother. He says, there's a, there's a cause. And it says right after this that he turned from him towards another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again. Now notice this. It was after he quit talking to his brother and repeated this that somebody heard it and then they repeated it to the king Saul and brought David before Saul if David would have been arguing with his brother this person wouldn't have heard him say this they wouldn't have repeated it to Saul and David wouldn't have had the opportunity that he had if he had been up in the grandstands he would have missed his opportunity I'm telling you you got to stay on track you got to do what God called you to do and watch the chaff to the wheat This is for some people that are here. God's got more for you than what you're living, and yet you're held back because of people's criticism and stuff, and you're wanting to appease everybody and wanting to be loved. God created us for acceptance. And I admit that there's nobody that likes rejection. If you lack rejection, something's wrong with you. But you need to get mature enough, pull your thumb out of your mouth and grow up to where you can live with it, amen, and go ahead and do what God called you to do, amen. So then they brought him before the king, and Saul said unto David in verse 33, thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. So... His brother had, had criticized him and said, you aren't able. Now, here's the king saying, you can't do this. You know, if, you, if, you are try, if the things that you are doing with your life, if your goals in your life are things that you can do in your own strength and power, if you can accomplish it with your ability, with your gifts and talents, 
then I can guarantee you, you have not found God's will for your life. God is going to call you to do something that's beyond yourself. And so here's everybody telling him he couldn't do it. And look how David responded. Here's how he was able to overcome this. He says, thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smote him and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smote him and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine. Here's a reference again to the covenant. He had a promise, a covenant with God. This uncircumcised Philistine uncircumcised Philistine will be as one of them seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God David said moreover the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear he will deliver me out of the hand of the, this Philistine and so David why was it that he had confidence when nobody else did first of all he had been anointed by God he was the anointed king he understood the covenant. He approached his situation on the basis of the covenant, not based on just natural, physical things. But also, he had proven God in his life. He had been faithful. And did you know that when he fought this lion and bear on the backside of the desert, there wasn't anybody in the grandstands. Nobody was watching. I'm sure that his dad wanted him to protect these sheep, but he didn't want him to give his life doing it that nobody would have faulted him if he would have lost one sheep. But instead, when it was something that was relatively small, nobody watching, people would have given him a pass and said it was okay. He was faithful, faithful, faithful. He did what he was called to do. And it was because he was faithful in a few things that God gave him the ability to be faithful in much. There are people that want God to use them in a big way. They want to be used. They want to do great things, but they aren't faithful in small things. You know, I'm an employer. We got 650 employees. And you know what? I love my employees. It's not that I'm mad at them or anything, but you know, I notice people who are faithful. There are people that will show up five minutes after it's time to go to work. And they leave five minutes before it's time to leave. If you give them a 15-minute break, they're going to take the 15 minutes, and then after the break's over, they'll go to the restroom, take another 10 or 15 minutes. They aren't faithful. They'll take paper clips. They'll take pens. They'll take things because, you know, it's a big ministry. Who's going to miss it and stuff? You aren't faithful. And yet you're going to be faithful when the, you know, the grandstands are full and there's thousands of people watching you when it's something big oh I'm going to be faithful but you wouldn't be faithful in a small thing that's the reason that God never opens up these other opportunities for you you may think that that's a small thing but I'm telling you if you aren't faithful in that which is least you won't be faithful in that which is much if I can't jump from here to the front row you ought to place money on the fact that I can't jump from here to the back row if you can't do that which is least, you can't do that which is greatest. And there are some of you that you're just, you aren't being faithful. You aren't giving it your whole heart. You don't serve people with all of your heart. Scripture says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we are supposed to, and this was talking about slaves and masters, that slaves were supposed to serve their masters not with eye service. That means not just when somebody's looking but doing it as unto the Lord, knowing that of the Lord you will receive whatever good you do. It's, it's not about people. It's not about whether or not they're watching you. You ought to be serving the Lord. You ought to be doing everything you do with your entire heart. And there's some people that they just aren't faithful and they wonder why God isn't opening up the doors. Well, it's not because he's punishing you. It's because he loves you. If you aren't faithful where you are, why would he just give you more responsibility and let you make a mess there? Again, I love all of my employees, but I can guarantee you, I find people with a faithful attitude, and those are the ones that we promote. And there's others. I don't treat any of my employees bad, but I can guarantee you, when I see somebody who's a slaggard, who slacker, who doesn't do a good job, I'm not going to make them a manager. I'm not going to promote them to be over other people and reproduce that thing. I love them. 
God loves us by grace, but he promotes faithfulness. You need to be faithful. The reason David had the confidence was because he had already proven God when it was something relatively small. When there, you know, he could have run from the thing and nobody would have faulted him, but man, he stood. And I don't believe, you know, it says over in the 16th chapter that David was the runt of the litter. He was a ruddy man, which what we would say, he was a mama's boy. He was pretty. Eliab was this big guy. David was a pretty boy. Calls him ruddy, beautiful. David wasn't a big, strong guy. The reason he killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. He took him by the beard and fought a lion and overcame him. It's the same thing that happened to Samson. It was the Spirit of God that came upon him. It wasn't his physical ability. It was the anointing of God on him. And you know what? Every one of us can do things beyond your physical ability if you would yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and just be faithful. God can anoint you and use you in supernatural ways. And so here's this little kid saying about how he killed a lion and a bear. And you know, it's amazing, but look at the last part of that verse. It says, Saul said unto David, go, and the Lord be with thee. This is amazing, because if David lost the battle, that meant that all of the Israelites lost. He was putting all of his hopes into this one little kid. This is amazing, but I believe that the reason it happened is because Saul at one time, if you go back to the 10th chapter... Saul was an introvert. Saul was so timid that when they went to anoint him, he was hiding in a basket. And they had to find him. And they drew him out. And he was taller than anybody else in the nation. The next tallest person came to his shoulder. He was a big man, but he was timid. And yet the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he took a yoke of oxen and cut them into 12 pieces and sent them to all of the different tribes in Israel. And he says, I'm going to do this to your oxen if you don't come. And the whole nation came after him and he recognized the anointing of God. It had transformed him. And he recognized this on David and that's the reason he put this kind of confidence in him. You know, when you are anointed by God and when you are speaking in the name of the Lord, other people can see it. But man, we've been too timid. And so Saul, after he told him, he says, all right, go. Then he took all of his armor and put it on David. Which Saul's armor wasn't doing him any good. Why did he think it would do David any good? You know what? People will resist you and say you can't do it. But then when they see the anointing of God on you and they see that you're going to go ahead and do it, then they'll chime in and start telling you how they would do it. (laughs) And they'll start trying to equip you with what hasn't been working for them. They'll give you all of their opinions. It was to David's credit that David put this armor on, but he says, I haven't proven this. And he put off his armor and went out to meet the giant without any armor. You know, Saul was the biggest man in the nation. David was a runt. I could imagine that David could turn around inside of that armor without moving it. It didn't fit him. You can't go by what other people tell you to do what has God told you to do you need a word from God and if you get a word from God and if you would obey that and do what has already worked for you you prove him in these small things then when you come up against big things I guarantee you you'll see the supernatural power of God manifest in your life and so David in verse 40 it says he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in a shepherd's bag which he had even in a script and his sling was in his hand and he drew near the Philistine five stones we don't know why he had five stones Goliath had four brothers it may be he was going to wipe out the whole family (laughs) eventually they did kill all of Goliath's brothers but it's also possible and this is something that people don't understand people think that if you're Uh, being led by the Lord and if you're doing things right then boom everything's just going to be perfect and you'll never miss he might have gotten five stones in case he missed four times and I know some people oh no if you're anointed by God everything just works that's not my experience (laughs) you know we moved into a building in Colorado Springs here and it was a 3.2 million dollar renovation and the Lord told me to do it debt free 
And at the rate money had been coming in, I sat down and figured it out. I'd have been 120-something years old by the time that we got that $3.2 million. But I went ahead and obeyed God. And we moved in 14 months after I began the project. But it was four months after school started. And we missed the goal. And so we moved in around November. And at the dedication of that building... I had a woman come up to me and she says, are you discouraged? Has it bothered you that you missed it by four months? And I just looked at her and I said, man, I've never done anything perfectly in my life. I said, I got $3.2 million above my normal expenses in 14 months. I look at this as a victory. It didn't work perfectly. It would have been better if it had been differently. We're, we've got a building, a $53 million building that we're going to be dedicating November the 3rd. But I'm shooting to be in there on uh, September when our school term starts. And you know what? That's what I'm shooting for. But if I don't make it, which I am going to make it, but if I didn't make it, I'd still be glorifying God. I'm going to get in there. It's going to work. In the last... Five and a half years, we've spent $73 million cash on buildings above my normal expenses without going in debt. Don't owe anybody. I'm telling you, it works. You're just too late to tell me this doesn't work. <laughs> so he got five stones, and he drew near. And when the Philistines saw him, he says, what am I? Am I a dog? That they're sending a little kid out here to fight me. And he says, come to me. I'm going to take you and feed your body to the fowls of the air. And look at what David said in verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will I deliver thee. In, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day into the fowls of the air and to the wild beast of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and it says that David ran towards him David wasn't tentative in this Man, he was bold. You know why? Because he had a covenant, because he had proven God faithful in the past. And because of that, it gave him great boldness. You know, when Jamie and I first got started, we were so poor, we couldn't pay attention. We went, when Jamie was eight months pregnant, we went two weeks with not a bite of food. We didn't have any money. We have struggled, struggled, struggled. But I've seen God's supply and God has increased and because of it, I can look at the things I'm doing now. I've got about a $200 million project ahead of me and you know what? I've got faith. It's all coming to pass. But you couldn't have, I couldn't have done that 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I've had to grow. I had to start standing where I was and doing things. And I'm telling you, this is why so many people don't see God come through in their life because you're waiting until God gives you a blinding flash of light about something that's earth-shattering, and then you're going to seek God, and then you'll be faithful. But you aren't doing anything right now. You've got to be faithful where you are. David had confidence. He ran towards Goliath. He threw the stone, and again, people think he was just a perfect marksman with this sling. He may have been. I'm not saying that he wasn't, but I'm also saying that, you know what, God doesn't... and the brightest and everything. He takes the weak things of this world, base things of this world, things that are despised, things that are nothing to bring to naught, things that are. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 28. He takes people that don't have it all together and uses us in spite of ourselves so that when it works, he gets the glory instead of that person. 
I'm not sure that David was a perfect marksman. Plus, every time I've ever seen anybody uh, describe the helmets that people wore at this time, they had a, a thing that covered your forehead and specifically right here in between your eyes because that was a vulnerable part. So if it talks about Goliath having a helmet on, if he had a helmet on that covered his forehead, no, no stone would penetrate that without the supernatural power of God. I believe that David did what he could do and he threw the stone, but God made it penetrate that armor. God made it sink into the giant's forehead and Goliath fell down. But here's another great lesson to learn from David. Did you know that the Philistines didn't flee when they saw Goliath fall down? I've been on the valley of Elah where this battle took place. And I mean, it's two miles, three miles up to the mountains where it says that the Philistines were on the mountains round about. There was this huge valley in between where the battle was going to take place. And I walked down to that little creek that went through, and I picked up five stones, and I stood there and looked at it and thought about all of this. And I can guarantee you those people were so far away that when they saw Goliath fall, they didn't know if he was defeated. Maybe he just got knocked down. Maybe he could have come back again. But look at this. It says in verse uh, 50, it says, So David prevailed over the Philistine with the sling and with the stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. They didn't flee when they saw him fall down. But when David stood on top of him, took the sword out of his own sheath and cut his head off and held his head up like this, there was no doubt Goliath was not coming back. Amen. <laughs> and that's when the Philistines fled. Here's another lesson to learn from David, that people will resist until they reach a place to where they're no longer in danger or it's led up, but they don't fight until they win. There's people, I've had people come to me before and says, I've got a pain and could you please pray for me? If I could just get to where I could tolerate it, it would be okay. I had one guy come to me and he says, I've got a pain in my neck. It goes down through my back. He talked about pain in his hips, a sciatica problem. It went down his leg into his feet and he had burning and stinging and he mentioned all of these things. And then he says, but you know, if God had just healed the pain in my neck, I could live with the rest of it. And I looked at him and I said, well, I understand what you're saying. I said, you know, if we were to ask God to heal everything from head to toe, I mean, the lights in heaven might dim. I I'm not sure God's got the power to pull that off. Let's just pray for something small so that God can handle this. And boy, he looked at me and he said, that's pretty dumb what I said. I said, it was real dumb. It's stupid. <laughs> But see, we just think, oh, God, I, I need $10,000, but I could get by with 1000 If you could just help me over this thing. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Man, God is awesome. God is mighty. You need to not only fight sickness until you get to where the incurable things are done, but you could live with these other things and manage them. You need to get to where you live in total health. Amen. Moses was a hundred... and 20 years old and his natural force wasn't abated nor his eyesight dim and he lived under a worse covenant than you and me if Moses could do that under an inferior covenant why is it that we put up with so much sickness and so much disease we just chase our enemy over the hill and allow him to come back and fight again 
You need to get an attitude where I'm not putting up with sickness. I will not be sick. I will not be poor. I am not going to be mean. I'm not going to be mad. I'm not going to have problems. I'm not going to have unforgiveness. And you just need to drive a stake in the ground and say, I refuse to move from this place. And this, man, we got a lot of, um, we got a lot of wimpy Christians. That just, you know, God, if you could just take care of the big things, I can handle the rest. You need to, you need to cut the head off of the devil. You need to get to where I refuse to compromise. Compromise is a language of the devil. And brothers and sisters, I love you enough to tell you the truth. I love you just like you are. But I love you so much I don't want you to stay like you are. I'm telling you, most Christians are putting up with stuff and allowing the enemy to survive and to go on when, you know, the Bible said, Jesus said that the gates of hell would not prevail against you. Most of us are withdrawn into our fortress, hoping that our gates will prevail. But we should be on the offensive. We ought to be out there fighting the gates of hell, knocking them down. You need to be out attacking the devil. He's stealing from you. There's people in here that don't have the prosperity that God has promised you. You don't have the health. You don't have the joy. You don't have the peace. And it's not up to God to give it to you. God, ha it's just like David. David was anointed, but if he would have been back there hiding behind the rocks and in the caves with everybody else and looking at things in the natural instead of through the covenant, he would have been just as defeated. It's not automatic that you're going to win. You got to stand up and fight. The Bible says, be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Ephesians 4, 26. People interpret that as saying, well, God knows we're human and we're going to get mad. And so he, you know, it's okay. He knows you're, you're going to get mad. Just make sure you get it confessed every night before you go to bed. That's not what that's saying. It says, be angry and sin not. There is a godly type of anger and you won't be sinning. And then don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. That means don't ever get complacent. Don't ever let it go to bed. Keep yourself stirred up. You need to hate sickness. You need to hate disease. You need to hate poverty. You need to hate depression. You know, on March the 4th, 2001, Jamie and I got a call at 4.15 in the morning that our son had died. And uh, so... We asked what happened. We had to get up and get dressed and drive down into Colorado Springs. I live over an hour from here. And we had to drive down here. And you know what? I hate depression. But I started feeling depressed. I started feeling grief, the same as anybody would if your son was to be dead. And I just hate it. And I decided I'm not going to have it. And so I started praising God. I started just worshiping the Lord and thanking Him God, you did not kill my son. It's not your fault. And I started worshiping him, and it's a long story, but anyway, the faith of God rose up on the inside of me. And our son, who had been dead between four and five hours in a morgue, stripped naked with a toe tag on, he was a white boy and he was black, he just sat up and started talking. And to this day, he is alive and well, doing good. brain damage no more than he had before and I'm telling you a large part of it was I just refused to be depressed I refused to be discouraged it's been four it's been nearly 50 years this coming 
Two weeks from now will be 50 years ago that the Lord touched my life. And I hadn't been depressed in, in probably 48 years since the Lord taught me some stuff. I refused to be depressed. I refused to be discouraged. I refused to be sick. I hadn't been sick in 48 years except twice when I acted stupid. <laughs> one time I ministered 40 times one week, and the next week I ministered 41 times. And I got so tired I had to crawl into bed, laid there for nearly 24 hours, and thought I felt good. I went out and split a quart of wood. Did too much too quick, and I got sick. That's just stupid. That's not sick. <laughs> but I don't believe in getting sick. Amen. And I know many of you thinking, man, you're weird. <laughs> well, I think you're weird. To have a covenant, to have a covenant that promises you he heals all of your sicknesses, all of your diseases, and yet you put up with it. He supplies all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, and yet you put up with poverty. He's taken all of your griefs and carried all of your sorrows. In the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore, and yet you will put up with being depressed and discouraged and fearful. I think that's weird. Why in the world would you not accept everything that God's got for you? Amen. I love you. I love you enough to tell you the truth, but I deal with a lot of people, and brothers and sisters, there's not one out of a thousand Christians that are even, have as a goal what God has set for them. Now, it's, it's true that there's a growth process, that there's a lot of things involved in it, but if you aren't shooting at the stars, I can guarantee you, you're going to miss them. But if you shoot at the stars and miss and hit the moon, that's more than most people ever do. Amen. You need to start looking for the power of God operating in your life. And David is just a great example of a little kid that in the natural, he was the least qualified of anybody, and yet God used him. And did you know that this instance of killing Goliath is what catapulted him to a position of leadership? David became a king. He accomplished things that nobody else had accomplished. And here we are 4,000 plus years later talking about David because one guy just believed in the promises of God. One guy was fanatical. You know what a fanatic is? Somebody is closer to God than you are. He was a fanatic. He loved God. And I'm telling you, God's got big things for you. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm going to turn it back over to Pastor Ken, but I... He's going to give an invitation after he receives an offering. But I want to encourage you today that if God has stirred you up, do something. The Bible says faith without works is dead. If, if God has spoken something to you and maybe quickened some things and shown you some things and say, I need to do something, do something about it. Don't just walk out of here and by the time you get through eating, you forget what God spoke to you. We'll have a prayer team down here. Come and let someone pray and just say, you know what, I'm making a decision then I'm going for it. Man, I'm going to do what God called me to do. I'm going to get out of the grandstands and trying to justify myself, and I'm going to get on the track and do what God called me to do and, and watch the chaff to the wheat. And you need to make a decision. If you don't know the Lord personally, man, this would be a great opportunity for you to come and realize it's only through the Lord that you're ever going to